So I want to share a short message uh, with you today. Uh, If you can open your Bibles with me to the book of Matthew 26. Matthew 26, beginning at verse number 36. I'm reading from a version called the Passion Translation. It reads really well, and it reads really um, honest. All right, when you got it, say, got it. Awesome. All right, so Matthew chapter 26, beginning at verse number 36, we're entering a moment where Jesus is in this place called uh, Gethsemane. And it reads as this, Then Jesus led his disciples to an orchard called the Oil Press. And whenever we're reading scripture and his disciples are following, I would encourage you to insert yourself and try to imagine what it would be like to also follow Jesus in that moment. So they followed him to an orchard called the Oil Press, and he told them, Sit here while I go near and pray nearby. He took Peter, Jacob, and John with him, And however, an intense feeling of great sorrow plunged his soul into agony. Tell your neighbor, Jesus feels. feels. Mm -hmm. And he said to them, my heart is overwhelmed and crushed with grief. It feels as though I'm dying. Can you stay here and keep watch with me? I want to pause there for a moment. If Jesus were to ever say to me or to you, hey, I'm overwhelmed and I might die. Like, what do you say to encourage Jesus? Um, praying for you, bro. Um, like, good luck. I mean, like, if he's overwhelmed, I, I got no hope for you, man. And then he walked a short distance away, and overcome with grief, he threw himself face down on the ground and prayed, My Father, if there's any way you can deliver me from the suffering, please take it from me. Yet, what I want is not important. Can we just pause there for a second? In a moment of intense emotional and physical distress, he prays a prayer and says, what I want is not important. That's not what I usually pray. He says, what I want is not important, for I only only desire to fulfill your plan for me. Then an angel from heaven appeared to come and strengthen him. I want to share a short message today called Make Room, called Make Room. Let's pray. God, I thank you for today, this moment, your presence in this place. Touch our lives, touch our mind, touch our emotions, and lead us closer to you. God, I pray for a deeper understanding of your love for us of your plans for our lives. And I pray, God, that you would also help us to find hope and strength in your word today. I pray that we will not leave here the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I I love this uh, passage. um, Well, not all the time, but I love it right now. Because we're entering a moment in Jesus' life where he's feeling a bunch of things. He's having to navigate a number of things. Specifically, the one thing he he doesn't really want to have to navigate with his life. And his body is communicating stuff to him. And he realizes he needs to get away from where he is and connect with God with some of his closest Friends, has your body ever communicated things to you? Mm -hmm. That's what's happening right now. And and I I love the story because, you know, if you were to take a a glimpse uh, at Jesus at this moment, it wouldn't appear that anything that bad is going on. But there's this unique invisible struggle this invisible turmoil happening almost internally that's causing him to be overwhelmed. And I I love, once again, this story because I love that my Savior knows what what it feels like to be overwhelmed. Jesus knows he has to eventually go to the cross to, to die, to pay the penalty for my sin and for your sin and to carry 
my shame and your shame and experience separation from God, but he's still honest in saying, guess what, y'all? I'm not sure I want to do it this way. So he knows what he has to do, but he's also like, you know what? I don't really want to have to do it this way. Can you relate to knowing what you have to do, but also understanding that I don't want to have to do it this way? But I also notice in the text is that Jesus feels deeply. Tell somebody next to you, Jesus feels deeply. Jesus feels deeply. And he doesn't want to experience suffering. I can relate to this. And I think when it comes to suffering, for me, if I'm honest, I I mean, the maximum amount of suffering I want to experience in life is probably uh, waiting in a Chick-fil-A drive-thru line. There's one location, I won't name it, in Lancaster. You know what I'm talking about. That one location, you, you can't even get in there. And that's probably the max I want to experience. I don't want to go much farther than that when it comes down to suffering. Or every, occasionally, for my daughter, the McDonald's drive through line. Because McDonald's, right? It's just, that's all I have to say. It's, it's always an experience. Like, why does it always have to be... Why can't it just give me what I, it's always this weird exchange and every, that's so consistent. Like, it's just. You see, always a unique experience. There's always some, even when you say McDonald's. <laughs> that was good, Lord. Okay, could not have planned that. Oh, you can relate. That's good. That's good. <laughs> so I want to share more of a personal a note to begin this, uh, this message. And I promise it will get uh, lighter in the room. But uh, recently, our family received some really uh, difficult news that my wife was diagnosed with cancer uh, for the second time in her in her life journey, and when I tell you that, like that was like, whoa! But what's happening here? Um, it was um, unexpected. Okay, it was a disruption for to life, and all that we had planned going on towards the very end of last year, and even plans for for the beginning of this year. And it was just like something just got tossed in the middle of already, you know, you already got stuff happening in life. You don't really need anything else to top it off. And that was just like, here's something that got dropped in. But it was unexpected. It was a disruption. Plans were immediately changed. Schedules were immediately interrupted. And the journey ahead, we thought of even how we were going to end the year and begin this new year. You know, like new year, new, maybe we're going to make all these new goals. We're like... Yeah, we're just going to sit down and eat some Chick-fil-A and just uh, sit in this for a little bit. But we just didn't expect that type of news. There was also uh, some good news to the story. And the good news is that the cancer was non-invasive, which was a massive deal for us. And so I could see just the grace and the mercy of God in that, but still up ahead, now we have process and surgery or surgeries. And it's like, this definitely was not part of our plans. It's in moments like this when our life gets quiet, life gets confusing, and it's often where we most feel misunderstood. But it's also in these moments of life when if we, we long to be understood by our friends and also by God. When I was younger, it was almost a badge of honor to kind of wear to say, you can't understand me. You'll never, un- you have no idea what I'm going through. I love to share that. I love to wear it. At the core of that, I really long for somebody to understand. 
there was something about being not like not being understood, but if I was honest, I wish there was somebody who did understand. And you see, this is why I still choose to follow Jesus. You may not be navigating a cancer diagnosis, but you are navigating something that may make you feel misunderstood or like no one can relate to what you're facing today. If you're facing rejection in your life, Jesus knows what it's like to face rejection. The very people he came to serve rejected him. Jesus faced the loss, physical loss, the emotional loss of friends who were very, very close to him. And he knows what it's like to lose close relationships. He knows what it's like to be made fun of. People mocked him and didn't believe that he really was who he said he was. He was innocent and he suffered for those who were guilty. Do you know what it's like to be accused of something that you were innocent of, that you had no, like, listen, I'm that person that if I'm innocent, you will not forget my name. I will fight you. I, I will make sure you are aware that I am innocent. And my wife would agree. <laughs> he was treated wrongfully by religious leaders he didn't quite fit in with his family. Did you know that Jesus was part of a blended family? That Jesus had a step-parent? So for the blended families in the room, he also understands. Can you imagine going to school and telling your friends and your siblings that um, yeah, you'll never meet my dad, but he made that mango that you love to eat every single day? <laughs> okay, Jesus, that is great. We believe you. <laughs> One of the most challenging parts, though, of navigating chaos and just life being like this, this orientating and even suffering is that it has the potential to distort how we view God, how we view ourselves, and how we view God's love for us. I'm going to say that one more time. When life gets chaotic and when the unexpected happens, it has the potential to distort how we view God, how we view ourselves, and how we view God's love for us. I want to share a quote with you by Soren Kierkegaard. It says, life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards. Whew. And, and, and it, it's really been helping me to think about when the stuff of life just starts piling in and you know, the way I'm wired, I, I want to think about, like, how does this make sense? Does it not make sense? What did you do wrong? What did I do wrong? The math isn't adding up. But really realizing that in the moment, trying to grasp and, and trying to get perfect clarity on why everything is happening is, like, impossible. But as I look over the course of my life and now I can look back at some things, the way I saw my teenagers, I see them differently now. The way I saw my 20s, I see them differently now. And even in my early 30s, I see them differently now because I have a depth of understanding at looking at life from a different lens. But when you're in it, our responsibility is simply to just keep moving ahead, even lacking clarity fully on why everything is happening. One thing I'm learning is that it is our responsibility to manage painful experiences, but not control them. I, I am learning that, and, and if you know me, I won't say I'm a control freak. I just want to know where stuff is at. Like, I don't, I don't need to control it. I just want to know, like, where's everything at? Like, I just want to know where, like, where does it belong? And where does it fit? And I, I don't need to control it. I, I don't think I do. <laughs> I don't think I do. But I, I'm, I, I'm learning that this is about management. Some stuff's going to hit your life. You'll be like, you know, it's going to be a gut punch. You're going to go, whoa, okay, okay. What's the game plan? Uh, 
Closest Chick-fil-A. I don't know right now. Sweet tea with lemon. I, I, don't, I don't know. I, that's all I got. That's all I got. And so, you know, management is really about awareness and, and, and really strategy. It's being aware of what you're thinking and feeling and choosing to get the necessary support to help fill in those gaps. So Jesus is like, all right, I'm overwhelmed right now. He's aware of what he's feeling. Hey, friends. Hey, homies. Let's go pray. All right? I need some help. I'm overwhelmed. I feel like I'm going to die. So management says, okay, I don't really know what the plan is, but I know I have some gaps, and where can I go to get the help that I need to help fill those gaps? That's my responsibility, not to control it. So managing my expectations about the next two months, next four months, the next year is really important because we all make plans, all have expectations, and we can even get so uh, um, religious in our thinking and trying to like do things to help speed up God's process. Let's, let's, let's just say, okay, every day, what am I expecting to happen? Because here's the thing, disappointment constantly will set in when we're not managing our expectations properly. Also, I have to manage my fears. We have to manage our fears, all right? Not control them, but when we notice fear creeping in, is this because what's driving this, right? Just because of a thought that creeped into my mind? Is this thought true? Does this thought align with God's truth about my life? Does this thought align with God's word? Where is it coming from? Is it from a friend? Is it from a song? Is it from a movie? Is it from my own heart? What's happening here? But really taking time to assess where is this stuff coming from and not deny it, but then say, you know what? I don't have to, to just give this thought all the attention that I really feel like I want to give it. One of the worst experiences in my life is believing a lie and then allowing my feelings to follow and then my body to follow my feelings. It is so possible to be holding on to a lie and allow that feeling to dominate what's happening in your body or to realize it was never true in the first place. So managing the fears is really important. Also, managing my capacity. This is hard for me. Constantly asking the questions like, what is in my wheelhouse? What can I do? What what can I do? What do I have the energy to do? But the one thing that God is reminding me right now is, Mike, you have to feel. You have to fight to feel. And, many, and, and I, I often want to fight to stay busy. Or I want to fight to help everybody else. But literally slowing down to feel. When you read the Psalms, the Psalms resulted in a man named David having such a weird life of difficulty But out of those feelings came some of the most powerful prayers that we pray today, some of the most powerful songs that we sing about the truth of God over our lives. So don't underestimate how important it is to feel. But back to the text, and Jesus says something that, once again, it really is challenging for me to grasp. It's, yet what I want is not important. For I only, to desire, only desire to fulfill your will in your plan for me. What I want, my will, is not as important than your will, God. And when life is, what I have to call when life is lifing, it is challenging to lean into that reality of like, could this be part of God's will for my life? And could I literally lay down all of my expectations of what my life needs to look like in order to trust God's will and his plan and his purpose? So, uh, you know, I've been wrestling with that. And I think that ability to pray that prayer speaks to a deeper relationship that Jesus has with his heavenly father. So I want to share a quick story with you. And I have a picture, I think, of, of me in front of a roller coaster um, this was in 2017, a long time ago, and you're going, why are you so dark? I was uh, in the sun for a whole week. Okay, 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 okay. So, <laughs> let's address it. Let's address the, anything else, the elephant in the room? Okay, no, I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> okay, 
focus. All right, so here's a story I want to tell. So if you know me, or I'll just share it. Um, how can I word this? It's not that I judge people who like roller coasters. I just don't understand roller coasters and, and, and how or why they might be fun for a human being who breathes oxygen. Here's why. Here's why. I'm not judging. I'm just sharing some reflections. Here's why. You know, for those of people who really love evolution, we haven't evolved to the point yet to need wings. So since we're not there yet, why are we testing the waters with gravity at this point in our lives? We, we just, we, I, 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 I don't understand it. Um, and the other part is like, people are like, well, I'm a, you're not a thrill seeker. Thrill seeker, have you lived life? <laughs> life has enough thrills every single day. Have you lived through 2020? Aren't you tired of thrills? I want land. I want land. <laughs> that, I want a thrill on land. <laughs> okay. So God has jokes. Here's why. Um, sometimes he watches you when you're in the giant parking lot trying to find your, <laughs> you're like, oh, man. And for 20, he's like, this is going to be good. No, I got distracted. So God does have jokes, though, because I married into a family that loves roller coasters. My wife loves them. My daughter loves them. My brother-in-law works for a theme park. And I was like, you knew this, didn't you? You did not reveal this to me. So over a number of months, uh, my brother-in-law was talking to me just about his experience working at this theme park and how much he loves it. And I'm like, yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't do I just don't do them. I don't enjoy them. They're not fun for me. That's fine. Like, your thing, not my jam. Okay. Um, but over a period of time, he began talking to me about, like, the safety of the rides and all the thing, things that they, went to, they were doing behind the scenes to prepare before the, the park even opened and all the checks they did. And I found myself, like, honestly, like, gaining a little bit more, more trusting of some of the rides at the parks that he was involved in and he worked on. Um, I found in our conversation that I, I became, you know, even more open to they say, well, what rides do, do you work at? They, I know your hand has been involved with the operations. The people I don't know, I don't, I don't trust them. I don't know. But what do you know about? What do you feel is safe at this theme park? And so I, all this to say, I found myself standing in line at the Incredible Hulk ride at Universal and, um, you know, you make a decision and your gut's like, what are we doing? And I'm like, well, you know, we're just, we're just in line. <laughs> you know, we're not fully committed yet. We're just in line. You can always walk out the line, you know. <laughs> and, and, then, and then there was a moment when, when you've been in the line for a while, but now you see the seats. <laughs> and you're like, <laughs> and my conscience is like, are we going to do this? And I'm just like, we're probably going to die today, but we're probably going to like it. <laughs> Like, no, you know, we're going to do it. And, and I remember getting close to the seat and rem just looking at it going, I'm about to do this thing. And I don't do this thing. But I look back and I remember seeing uh, my wife's family and my brother-in-law there. And just even having him, his presence there on the ride with me was so, so reassuring. And so we get in and we get strapped in and he's like super excited. He also has this smile that's kind of like, you don't know if he's like, it's like a smirk. Like, am I going to die or not? Like, you know, you don't really know. It's just like, I'm glad you're here. And I'm just like, are you? Like, <laughs> but, I, but I feel good because he's at least there and he's smiling and everybody's happy. And I'm like, okay, like we're doing this. And so the ride begins to take off. And in this specific ride, you're, you're kind of indoors, then you go outdoors. And you're, you're sitting back like this. And everything's fine. And then all of a sudden, I, I hear like the Incredible Hulk like, like, get, like yelling. I'm like, he sounds angry. Like, he does not sound happy that we're here, right? <laughs> and, and, and I remember going, at that moment, we shouldn't have, I shouldn't have done this. Because he's going to, lit, like, throw us out of this thing and just stuff's going to happen. So I survived that moment, and then we're on the ride. Most times I'm like this, eyes open, like, yes, this is great, you know? And um, 
I remember like just the, 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 the sounds of joy and laughter from my daughter, my wife, and my brother-in-law. And I remember getting off the ride going, when I survived, that was a game changer. I survived. But also, I kind of want to do it again. So I will admit to you that I got back in line and got on the ride one more time just to experience it again. And I was reflecting on that and thinking about what was it that really gave me the confidence and courage to step into that moment? Well, I mean, I was very, very aware of my fears and the risks involved with getting on this ride. However, I had a depth of relational access to someone who had a level of influence over what I did not have control over. There was something about the relationship with my brother-in-law and me, his knowledge, his influence, that helped me say, you know what? I don't know, but he does. And I just want to step into a moment and just say, maybe, maybe, one of the keys to navigating the difficulty and pain and suffering in life is not trying to figure out the whole experience, but getting a depth of access to our Heavenly Father, who still does have control over the crises in our lives, and though we cannot control them, maybe there's something that He knows that we don't know. And so my confidence really was not in the ride. It was in the word of what my brother-in-law was telling me week and week after week about what I was going to experience. And that was my confidence. It wasn't in the ride itself. It was in him. There's a story when Jesus, uh, a couple stories. One story, he's in a boat with his disciples and they're in the storm and he's kind of resting and sleeping with them. Oh, well, he's sleeping. They're not sleeping. They're terrified, actually. But he's sleeping. But he's with them. Okay, he's with them. <laughs> Another story uh, where he's walking on water in the middle of a storm, and they're losing their minds. And then he invites one of them to step out of the boat and join him on the water. Two different stories. What's, what's the message here? S- Jesus is a Savior who's willing to get with us in the middle of what we're experiencing so that we do not feel alone. But he's also the same savior that will say, okay, how about stepping out on this water that you have been so terrified of and maybe with my help and with my strength, maybe you can have the power to walk on that which has been walking all over you. Maybe there's a little more more to it. My next slide as I begin to to close is I want to share a couple of things that I think it's important for us to do when it comes down to making room, okay, to making room. And and in this text, Jesus is literally in this place called uh, the Olive Press, Gethsemane, where uh, they're near this structure where stones will be rolled over the actual olives themselves, and they will be pressed down to then bring about something called olive oil. And my next slide I want to share with you is, I think it's important to make room to be repurposed. Make room in your life, in my life, to be repurposed. This moment in Jesus' life is a reminder that life will press us, but life will not destroy us. It will press us. It will not destroy us. So I, uh, I got these olives here. It's probably Target, right? Market Pantry? I already know. Okay. I got these olives here. This is from our house, olive oil my wife was cooking with. And, you know, to, to, you have the olives here in their, in their physical form that after going through a period of pressing and crushing now produces something called olive oil. I would encourage you to either go in the store next time you're there or go online and just do the comparisons of the prices of olive oil versus the price of olives. The value isn't the same. It's much, much different. And and part of it has to do with the process, but also part of it has to do with the use. Sometimes... In seasons of life, when we are being pressed, we don't really have an understanding of why God or if God is in this, 
what is the true intent or true purpose of the pressing? Now, Jesus is in this moment called the, the, in, called the olive press, where his life is being squeezed and his life is being pressed. And he's been known for doing three years of this type of ministry, but he's leading up to this next moment where he's getting ready to die and his blood is going to be shed for all of humanity. His life is getting ready to be a little bit repurposed. Where he's not just here to walk amongst us physically, but he's also here to die and shed his blood to cover us eternally. So the question I want to ask is, if you're in a season of life where you feel like life is being pressed, are you content with your life simply producing olives? Or are you willing to explore what it's like for your life to produce oil? Because if you're like me, when God begins to press in on my life, I'm going, but God, I am well aware of the value my life brings in this condition. I am well aware of the value my life brings to people in this condition. But I might be unaware of what you really desire to do with my life in that condition. Is just what is it about the oil and the reach of the oil that I am unaware of when I'm so content with my life simply looking like this and being like this and feeling like this? But there's something about the oil. Can I talk about the oil a little bit? Y'all, I'll talk about the oil just for a minute. So, in, in some moments, the oil was used to anoint the next, the next prophet, the next king, the next leader. And I want to speak to just my generation of leaders and people today and just say perhaps the pressing that you're going through in life right now isn't just about what your life is to produce right now, but perhaps there's oil that God wants to use to flow from your life to the next generation that's coming after you. Perhaps God truly desires for us to not just pass on our trauma, but to pass on our healing. So what does it look like for a generation that you got, you know what, I know I don't want to experience the pressing, but I am after the oil that you're after that you want to flow from my life. There's more to the pressing than I am aware of. And in all of my resisting, in all of my fussing, and in all of my fighting, I'm telling God I'm just content with producing olives. And God is whispering, you have no idea what I intended to use your life for. So in some instances in life, I will allow pressing because that's the only way the pressing will allow the oil to be released from your life to do what it intended to do with your life. We are pressed to produce. It's counterculture. Uh, in the economy of God, we produce more when our lives get reduced. <laughs> In the economy of God, less is actually more. I want to share one more slide with you because this moment of Gethsemane is before another event called resurrection. So I want to encourage you today, if you're in a pressing season, to also make room for resurrection. And Gethsemane is a reminder that resurrection is also on the way. I want to share a picture of, uh, with you that is really a funny story, too, of these, these plants. And um, a number of years ago, uh, my wife was uh, out in front of the house with these, these big clippers we had just like going to work on everything that was weeds that we didn't know what, what it was. And so she was just going to town. One of our neighbors said, um, hey, like, don't cut that. Like, what? This is just weird colored flowers. You know, weeds, you know, like weeds, literally, they can be really, really beautiful, really deceptive. And so uh, she was hacking away at these flowers. And uh, our neighbor just said, you know what? Um, 
those are like, those are pumpkins coming in. They're like, what? Pumpkins coming in. We didn't plant any pumpkins. We didn't plant any pumpkin seeds. And if you know where I'm from, you know I didn't plant any pumpkin seeds. Um, (laughs) So I'm like, how in the world did this happen out of nowhere? And in the front of our yard and then in the back of our yard, we had these crazy, beautiful flowers and pumpkins growing. And I remember, I remembered uh, the year prior, my wife loves to put out uh, pumpkins on, on the steps just for decorations around Thanksgiving and the holidays, like orange and yellow kinds of pumpkins. And one, the one year we left them out a little too long and our daughter had to like pick them up. And of course, like everything inside just, it was, it was a bad scene. I wasn't there for it. I heard it was a bad scene and it smelled like a bad scene. But isn't it crazy that out of something that was dying and decaying, it still carried the seeds of life within it? And we had no idea that the seeds that were within the dying pumpkins were being planted in new soil without our awareness, without our intentionality, and without our help to blossom into these beautiful pumpkins and flowers. What am I trying to say? In the economy of God, many deaths in our lives, reductions, loss, grief, hold the seeds required to produce new life. I can't fully explain how he does it. I just know there's a seed, even with any kind of loss in life, with any kind of loss you're facing, there's a seed that has the potential to produce new life. This could lead to renewed faith in Jesus, restored relationships, inner peace and healing, and letting go of some of the old way and some of the old dreams could we open our hands to new dreams that we had no idea that God wanted to impart to us. This could also lead to new and fresh power from the Holy Spirit, all in opening our hands and being okay with letting go. Letting go with our will, our way, our plan, our vision, being aware of the grief that comes with that, being aware that God also is a God of not just loss and grief and death, but he's the God of new life and resurrection and hope that is also just around the corner. I can't always explain how he does it. It's just how he does it. As, as I close this message today, I want to uh, invite our worship team out. And um, I've been holding on to uh, uh, this bridge of this song the last couple of weeks. And uh, in my last slide, really, in all the making room for things, I think it's important that we, that we slow down. As trying, I'm trying to figure out all that's happening in life. It's important to slow down, to simply make room to receive the love of God. I've been asking myself the question, what was it that kept Jesus going when he knew he did not want to go any farther? What was it that allowed him to say, God, not my will, but your will be done in this matter And I believe that it was rooted in something that happened to him when he was baptized. And the Bible says when he was baptized, the Lord uh, proclaimed from heaven, this is my son whom I love and who I am well pleased. Before he did any ministry, before he did anything good, before he did anything right, he was rooted and grounded in who he was and so aware of God's love for him. So even in the garden where the oil press is there and he's feeling all that he's feeling, he's not not nervous that in making a wrong decision, God's love won't be there. 
he is well aware whether he decides to go forward or not, God's love is unchanging and it will never change no matter what he decides to do. And I think it's important in our lives to really reassess, do I actually believe that God loves me? Because the stuff of life can, can really throw some blows that may impact how we see God's love for us. So our team's going to sing just a couple of words in the song, and I just want to maybe encourage you to posture, maybe just if you want to sit with your hands open, just like, God, I just want you to receive that, that depth of love for me. If you want to stand, you can stand and worship with us. They want to sing, and then I'll come back up in a couple of moments, and I'll close uh, in prayer. For the one who 
I wanted us to, you can stand with me if you can. Um, I wanted us to, to kind of end today with a deeper revelation of God's love for us that kind of takes a higher priority place in our lives than all the stuff we may be experiencing. Because when it's just you and your thoughts, if the awareness of how much God loves you is not clear, wrestling in these moments is going to be impossible. But I love what Romans 8 says. It says, I'm convinced that nothing can separate us from God's love. Not death, not life, not angels, not demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries for tomorrow, not the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. Now, what you're facing today can't separate you from God's love, or what you're afraid of tomorrow can't separate you from God's love.